it's my pleasure on behalf of the Madison program to welcome you to today's lecture. Jean Jarrett, our lecturer, is Dean of the Faculty and the William S. Todd Professor of English here at Princeton. He's the author of the book Representing the Race, subtitled A New Political History of African American Literature, and Deans and Truants, subtitled Race and Realism in African American Literature. He's also the co-editor of the collected novels of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the figure, intellectual figure he'll be talking about today, and the complete stories of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. His latest book, and the book that uh, we're now uh, featuring, is Paul Lawrence Dunbar, The Life of a Caged Bird, which was published by our own press, Princeton University Press, in 2022. Dean Jarrett has been the recipient of fellowships from Harvard, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study there, and the American Council of Learned Societies. There will be copies of the Dean's book available, and I'm sure you'd be happy to sign them uh, after the lecture, the book on uh, Dunbar. And today's lecture is entitled, Of Course I Shall Defend You, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's Alliances with Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington. Please join me in welcoming Dean Jean Darrett. Thanks so much, Professor George, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I, I just want to say something specific about Robbie. Uh, you go by Robbie. Uh, he and I, when we first uh, met and I understood that he was the parliamentarian at the university, we also had a common interest in biographies of the founding fathers, if you That's recall, right. right? And so uh, he and I uh, talked about the art of understanding the turn of the um, 18th century. And, uh, and, and Robbie and I have been close colleagues working uh, in Nassau Hall as we superintend faculty meetings. And he's a person of remarkable dignity. And so I've enjoyed uh, being his colleague. And I'm grateful that he um, was um, so uh, encouraging in inviting me uh, here. And so it's an honor to be here um, in front of you. Um, and so this uh, biography that I produce, you might be wondering, how did I come to write it? Well, I was a student here at Princeton. I think many of you are aware of that. And I wrote about Paul Lawrence Dunbar in my junior thesis in the English department. <laughs> and so, uh, so that is to say, something can come out of a junior paper that you write <laughs> uh, at, at Princeton, uh, not only the grade. Uh, and, uh, I focused, on his, I focused on his first novel called The Uncalled. It was published in 1898, and I learned that it belonged to a curious genre of uh, African-American literature, not about African-American life. It's one of the ironic gestures of African-American authors, and that was the basis for what came to be my doctoral dissertation at Brown University. And as time went on, uh, you can see on the far left was my first book, Deans and Truants, that came out of my doctoral dissertation. So the seed of my thinking on Dunbar came from my time here at Princeton, and it uh, flowered into my first book. And I talk about Dunbar even more in my second book, Representing the Race. Uh, and then finally, the, the biography of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, The Life and Times of the Caged Bird. I worked on that book for 14 years, if you <laughs> that's, that's a longer period of time than the age of my youngest child, who's 12. Right? And so I had to break the news to her that Paul does not actually exist. He's just a, a, a figment of my scholarly uh, imagination. But you know, that's, not only have I spent quite a bit of time with Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, in these books that I've written, but also in the books that I've edited. And so you can see his likeness is familiar here. And, and from the left, there's an anthology of African-American literature that is being used uh, in classrooms around the world. I include Dunbar. I've also edited uh, his novels and short stories. And then also on the far right-hand side, a book that I've co-edited with Henry Louis Gates Jr. includes excerpts of uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I had uh, completed writing this third book of mine to coincide with the 150th anniversary of Dunbar's birth, given that he was born on June 27, 1872. So this past, last year, there had been wide public discussion and celebration of Dunbar, people from many walks of life, 
have come to realize that he was a prodigy. He had a crucial impact on his times and inspired people even after he died on February 9th, 1906. At the young age of 33, Dunbar resonates especially among those who reside in his hometown of Dayton, Ohio, where several museums and libraries have been dedicated to preserving his writing and artifacts. Elsewhere across the country, this anniversary has excited expert students and fans of Dunbar while piquing the interest of those who've encountered him for the first time. So I hope this lecture of mine will excite your interest uh, as well. Prodigious and prolific, Paul was a serious professional writer for a total of 18 years from 1888 until his death. During this time, he released 14 books of poetry, four collections of short stories, and four novels, a body of work that showcased his mastery of literary genres. Newspapers and magazines across the country syndicated many of the individual texts in his 18 books of poems and short stories. Across various mainstream and obscure periodicals, he also published essays on the progress, productivity, and challenges of African Americans from the dawn of their enslavement to their newfound new franchise and freedom in the decades after the Civil War. To wide acclaim, he recited his poems, as you can see, or delivered speeches in private homes, churches, schools, and auditoriums across America's East Coast and the Midwest, as well as the cities of England. And he drafted experimental works, including librettos and drama, that exhibited his promising artistic versatility. The quality, breadth, and diversity of his literature especially inspired countless people around the world. But a biography of Dunbar cannot merely be a story of the intellectual ideas that informed the way he wrote literature, nor can be, it be only an exploration of the mental, emotional, and moral compass by which he oriented himself in the world. By the way, I didn't turn on my microphone. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now fine? Yes? I don't, I, maybe I'm unchanged, but I, I didn't turn it on on my hip. Um, it must also recount the wider historical forces that shaped, shaped his personality. These are the forces that guided the various personal and professional choices that lay before him and that he believed would determine the course of his life, career, and legacy. One must tell the full yet intimate story of an African American who wrestled with the constraints of America in the Gilded Age, but also who sought to express or mitigate the strife through the written and spoken word. Reared during and after Reconstruction, Paul belonged to a generation of African Americans whose parents were slaves and who were adjusting to the capitalist modernity of America. Nonetheless, Dunbar would turn out to be the first African American born after slavery, that is, the first modern. African-American writer, I argue, to achieve commercial prosperity and international stature exclusively by his literary pen. In this lecture, I tell the little known yet remarkable stories of how Dunbar captivated powerful political leaders across the so-called Colonel Line at the turn of the 20th century. Paul Ernst Dunbar's legendary accomplishments as a writer so intrigued Theodore Roosevelt, for example, that over the years he grew to admire and sought personally to advance the poet's literary success. And Booker T. Washington promoted an industrial ethos of education with which Dunbar alternately agreed and disagreed as an intellectual, but which nonetheless brought them closer together socially. These alliances played key roles in Dunbar's fascinating access to elite constituencies of readers and sources of political power in post-war America. Sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. There you go. Paul's deep philosophical preoccupation with the so-called Wizard of Tuskegee, Booker T. Washington, began in 1898, even though they first corresponded about two years before in summer of 1896, right after William Dean Howells' review of major and minors. That was the review that launched Dunbar onto the international map. By that time, early time, the story of Washington's personal life and political rise was nothing less than extraordinary. Born enslaved in southwestern Virginia five years before the Civil War, Booker, Booker T. Washington lived a stratified ancestry. His biological father was a white man with whom he had interacted little and who likely was his mother's master. And he borrowed his stepfather's first name to serve as his own. Raised in poverty, he worked in the salt furnaces and coal mines of West Virginia throughout his childhood, an education in physical toil that predicted his eventual commitment to manual and industrial training. 
He attended formal school at night. In 1872, he walked 200 miles to the Hampton Institute in Eastern Virginia, seeking to advance his education. In the early days of Reconstruction, Hampton was founded under the auspices of the American Missionary Association to educate African Americans and Native Americans. There he was introduced to Samuel Chapman Armstrong, a Union Army general who believed that industrial education best prepared former slaves economically for the postbellum world. At Hampton, with Armstrong as his mentor, Washington worked as a janitor to pay his room and board and ultimately graduated with honors three years after he arrived. Though he briefly attended Wayland Seminary in Washington, D.C., by the late 1870s, he had returned to serve on the faculty at Hamilton. His life underwent a momentous change when General Armstrong recommended that he become the leader of a new normal school modeled on Hampton in Tuskegee, Tuskegee Alabama. At the outset, it consisted merely of a barn, a plot of land, and a small amount of money to pay for teachers, books, and equipment. Modest resources that would slowly but inevitably grow to become a campus with dormitories, classrooms, libraries, and an endowment exceeding a million dollars by the turn of the century. And if you adjust for inflation, that's a lot of money. Officially, the school was founded on July 4, 1881. To build Tuskegee, Washington courted white patrons of considerable wealth to donate to the institution. In doing so, he espoused a system of cultural and economic values of racial uplift that eschewed calls for, among African Americans for political agitation or even absolute racial integration. His declaration in his September 1895 speech at the Cotton States and International Exposition that in all things that are purely social, he said, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand, and all things essential to mutual progress, struck a tone of assurance for his Southern audience. But these words infuriated not a few African American leaders, especially civil rights activist and educator W.E.B. Du Bois, who bemoaned not only Washington's intentional or perceived condoning of racial segregation, but also his delaying of economic and intellectual progress and the emphasis on industrial training. Indeed, Tuskegee became an institutional metaphor of the educational and political machine. It was called a Tuskegee machine that advanced Washington's conservative philosophies of industrial and economic education for African Americans. When on June 24th, 1896, he became the first African American to receive an honorary degree from Harvard, his stature as the leading African American educator and politician of his time was cemented merely nine months after he leapt onto the national stage in Atlanta. As he was approaching the height of his political powers, Washington sent Paul Lawrence Dunbar a congratulatory letter a few days after the famous review of majors and minors that Dunbar that launched Dunbar into this national spotlight. The poet was touched that a renowned educator took time to write him. Dear sir, Paul began his letter of reply, yours of late date received with great pleasure. I thank you for your words of encouragement and congratulation. Going further, Paul suggested that he, the lowly poet in Washington, the lauded politician, had much in common. I think that you, for one, can thoroughly understand what all this means to me after a long and hard fight. I have, gone, I have gotten nothing without working for it and have contested every bit of the ground over which I've passed. Albeit respectful in direct communication with Washington, a month and a half later, Paul signaled that in private, the Tuskegee machine was unsettling. By the fall of 1898, Paul was fed up with the political movement for industrial education led by Booker T. Washington, their friendship, which Alice Ruth Moore, his his companion at that time, Be Damned. In an essay titled Our New Madness, published in the August issue of The Independent, Paul registered his skepticism toward the feverish delight across the country with the industrial education of African Americans. The essay formed a public wedge between them. The public excitement over Washington's advocacy for the training of the hand and the head tended to focus more on the former than the latter. Given that the experience and expertise of African Americans with manual labor had been well proven ever since the days of slavery, their promise in the intellectual realm where there existed all appreciation for the beauty of art, science, and literature 
continued to go unrecognized. Paul lamented that there had not yet, in the history of the country, he said, risen a single intellectual black man whose pretensions have not been sneered at, laughed at, and then lamely wondered at. In this context, Paul criticized the wizard of Tuskegee. No one should question the ability and honesty of purpose of Washington, he said, whom he regarded as an earnest man. But Paul regretted that Paul's influence, Paul regretted that Washington's influence was turning out to be counterproductive. I do fear that this earnest man is not doing either himself or his race full justice in his public utterances. Washington says we must have industrial training and the world quotes him in detached paragraphs as saying that we must not have anything else. More preferable would be if the media and the public tempered the craze for industrial education with, as Dunbar put it, a right idea of the just proportion in life of industry, commerce, art, science, and letters, of materialism and idealism, of utilitarianism and beauty. The exclamation highlighted the bafflement, but also the urgency with which Paul implored his fellow citizens to correct their thinking. The essay, Our New Madness, did not go unnoticed by Booker T. Washington, who not only read it, but received letters from colleagues who did notice it as well. Less than a week after the essay appeared, Emmett J. Scott, a special managerial and philanthropic advisor at Tuskegee, wrote Washington to express reservations about Paul's wisdom. Washington concurred, likewise mystified and saddened by what he saw as reckless indiscretion, yet also a stalwart in defense of the cause. I'm very, softy, I'm very sorry that he had suffered himself to fly off in this way, Washington wrote not because it will do Tuskegee or the cause of industrial education any harm, but I regret to see a man discuss something about which he knows nothing. Washington never confused Paul's domains of expertise. In matters of poetry and fiction, Dunbar is a master. In matters of industrial education and the development of the Negro race, he is a novice, Booker T. Washington wrote. In the 19th century, more people died from tuberculosis in the United States more than any other illness. And in Europe, the disease was responsible for roughly one in four deaths. In the seven decades prior to Paul's death, 20% of deaths in the country resulted from this disease, whose symptoms tended to be chronic, their diagnoses delayed, but whose afflictions did not discriminate by race or age, class or region. Tuberculosis was not easy to diagnose. Its early symptoms of cough, general fatigue, and inflammation of the lungs resembled those of the common cold. And many people who were infected did not become ill for months or even years after initial exposure. By the end of the century, it was typical for physicians to prescribe alcohol as an oral remedy. Alcoholism was the collateral damage, incurring recidivism, especially among those who sought to quit the liquor bottle in the first place. Just a quick aside, when I was uh, at the Paul Lawrence Dunbar house in Ohio, Paul Lawrence Dunbar himself had a cane that if you unscrewed the top, he had a slot in there for, uh, for uh, alcohol for him to drink, right? And so it was, it was rather clever. It's not something I endorse, but it, was, it just attested to uh, how addicted he was. This turned out to be Paul's fate, alcoholism. It was not atypical for bouts of sickness to interfere with his literary tours although he strove to keep the symptoms at bay. While I am not very well in health, all goes well with me, he wrote to his mother during the summer months of 1897 in England. I've caught a cold and it has settled in my throat to some extent, he said. However, in the late spring 1899, Paul contracted an illness so severe that it bore the symptoms of tuberculosis and received public coverage, albeit as pneumonia or consumption. In May of 1899, Paul was scheduled to give a reading in Albany. He had been looking forward to it because he had traveled there before and enjoyed the visit. Indeed, from November 28th through December 9th of the previous year, he had gone there as part of his recital tour. Coincidentally, Winfried Merrill, an Albany club woman who also happened to be in 1886, the first American woman to earn a doctorate in mathematics, invited him to give a recital at a meeting of the fortnightly club of which she was a member. In reply, 
Alice Ruth Moore, Dunbar's companion, said she hoped that he would regale her with his tales of his adventures while there. Write to me, dear, and tell me about the good times in Albany, she wrote. Paul stayed at the Hotel Kenmore and recited poems on December 8th at the Fortnightly Club. The audience included luminaries ranging from socialites and religious and politi political leaders to Melville Dewey, the librarian and founder of the so-called Dewey, De Dewey Decimal System, uh, catalog cataloging library books. Before proceeding on to the rest of his regional tour, Paul telegrammed Alice through Western Union to affirm the success of his trip. All right now for Toledo, Albany good, he said. Paul had nothing but fond memories of Albany when he prepared to return there five months later until he fell sick and had to deal with the aftermath. Newspapers broke the news. Paul launched Dunbar ill, read one headline in the New York Tribune, stating that the Afro-American poet was seriously ill with pneumonia. The article indicated that he came last Sunday on April 29th to fill engagements here in New York City and in Albany and was taken ill almost upon his arrival and under the advice of a physician, went to bed, developing such acute pneumonia that his wife, who was in Washington, was sent for. Consequently, Paul has been compelled to cancel all engagements. In the days following this report, smaller newspapers regurgitated or embellished the story. From all around, letters came in. Friends and acquaintances who had read the newspaper stories reached out to extend their best wishes to Paul. I was so grieved to see in the papers that you were very ill with pneumonia, wrote Roger Clark, whom Paul had befriended during his tour of England and who continued to live, it, live there in Somersetshire and can only hope that newspaper accounts are in accordance with all tradition exaggerating. A week into May, Paul was feeling better Paul is doing well, plus the doctor is very proud, Alice wrote Paul's mother, Matilda. The illness still exacted a professional price. He could not fulfill his upcoming obligations for his reading tour, which included another visit to Albany. Constituents of Albany were not pleased. Between May and October, a volatile exchange erupted between Paul and the National Afro-American Council, a civil rights organization. John Edward Bruce, a council officer in Albany, was a primary player. Despite Bruce's hearing of reports that the poet was so near death's door that he could hardly hear the creaking of the hinges, the officer said that he would have been satisfied with the payment of the amount ad advanced for transportation. He sent word to Paul that he expected this reimbursement to be settled. Yet Paul took offense at the expression at the nature of the request. He accused Bruce of having appointed a lawyer to hound his wife, Alice, during his illness and having designs on accessing his bank account. Bruce denied that he would ever submit a morally ill man to such persecution. Paul also entered an equivalent dispute with Francis Peregrino, an emigre from Ghana by way of England, living in Albany and working as the publisher of the fortnightly Spectator. Peregrino sought to defend himself and his colleague Bruce from Paul's vitriol. Sir, patience having ceased to be a virtue, I have been compelled very reluctantly to take some notice of your treatment of myself and Mr. Bruce, Peregrino wrote. I can but add ju that justice to us dis dictates that the thing shall not cease, and this is our preliminary step unless some steps are taken to set us right. Within days of this letter, Paul communicated with the most powerful person in whose backyard this kerfuffle was occurring, Theodore Roosevelt. Certainly, it was remarkable that the poet would even consider requesting help from someone like Roosevelt, who lived in rarefied air of American culture and politics and was presently serving as governor of the state. By his early 40s, Roosevelt had a distinguished upbringing and career. Born to a prominent family, educated at Harvard, married twice, and the father of five children. He was the youngest man ever elected to the New York State Assembly, which he served from 1882 to 1884. He published three books on his hunting trips and life as a ranchman in North Dakota. A handful of years later, in 1889, he was appointed the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, a position he held for six years. He resigned to become the police commissioner of New York City, during his tenure, he enacted several major reforms, especially a war on vice, a moralistic model capturing his prerogative to clean up the city. 
He fleshed out his vision of cultural morality in his 1897 book, American Ideals and Other Essays, about what Americans could and should be. A year later, he was promoted to assistant secretary of the Navy during the Spanish-American War, but then he resigned to join the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry Regiment as lieutenant colonel and formed the illustrious Rough Riders, which fought on the island of Cuba. With his return as a war hero, he was elected in 1898 as the 33rd governor of New York. On November 1st, 1899, Roosevelt received Paul's letter of concern, claiming that he was being unfairly and perhaps illegally treated. Roosevelt sympathized with Paul's plea. I have just received yours of the first instance, he wrote. This is the first I've heard of this matter. From what you say, I should judge that you've been simply blackmailed. The governor offered himself as the poet's protector. If any attack is made upon you, of course, I shall defend you, he promised. He sought to wash away the poor taste the exchanges with Bruce and Peregrino had left in Paul's mouth. In fact, if you come to Albany again, Roosevelt assured, let me know and I'll take the matter of the reception to you into my own hands. At any rate, to the extent of seeing that thoroughly reputable people take hold of you. The subsequent anger expressed by Peregrino unsettled Paul no longer. Sir, Peregrino wrote Paul, your insolent behavior is perfectly on par with a man who would accept by seeking money for his fare from Washington to New York, then fail to keep his appointment. No matter. With the newfound shield of a governor who is on a trajectory toward an even higher office in American politics, the poet could let Peregrino's threats roll off his shoulders as he himself aspired to a higher status among American writers. In the meantime, Paul had to get healthy. Months after his exchange with Roosevelt, Dunbar traveled to Colorado. Mr. Dunbar has gone to Denver for his health, so stated the Topeka plane dealer, which caught up with Paul just before he traveled there. He was scheduled to arrive in Colorado by way of Omaha on September 12, 1899. He's ill with consumption, one lung being very, very badly affected, and is going to try the mountain air in the hope that it will be beneficial. Optimism fueled his desire to travel to Colorado, the region he believed was the key to his survival, if only because the outdoors brought pleasure to all his sensibilities, not only relief from his respiratory ailments. I shall get outdoors when I am in Colorado, he anticipated. That is the only thing for the lungs. I shall ride all the time on his horse, that is. Word started circulating among the elite that Paul was in town. Booker T. Washington mentioned the news in passing in a letter to a confidant, the newspaper editor, Timothy Thomas Fortune. In the letter, the Tuskegee leader alleged the jealousy held by the American Missionary Association secretaries, whose sentiment fueled an article appearing in the mid-September issue of the Washington Post designed to do anything to break my influence, he thought. Washington decided to convene a meeting in the next month and a half with the secretaries to address their concerns. To close the otherwise petulant epistle, Washington ventured, I hear that Dunbar is in a bad fix and has gone to Colorado. Fortune replied, first of all, with empathy for Washington's protest over the American Missionary Association. Both men shared the supportive view of industrial education as the driver of economic progress of the Negro, so to speak. So Fortune was inclined to pass along the Post article and monitor the aftermath. I will watch the influence of the Post article, he assured Washington, but the damage of it will be done with those who sustain our education work and are never heard of in the public prints. Amid their mutual encouragement during the never-ending controversy over the Tuskegee machine, Fortune corroborated Washington's report on Dunbar's poor health and therapeutic self-exile. I too understand that Dunbar is in a bad way and has gone to Colorado Spring. Like Washington, Fortune was acquainted with Paul, but for this information, he had witnessed and anticipated the future severity of the poet's poor health. When I last saw him, he declared that he would not go near Colorado, so I judged from his going that he's in worse shape than I saw him last. Then fortune dropped the bombshell that few would prognosticate for such a young man. I did not think he would live six months. If he pulls through the winter, I shall be surprised. He did not anticipate that the Dayton poet would even reach his 28th birthday. 
Washington was so worried about this news that when he scheduled a trip to Denver early the following year, he came and left in late January, mainly to deliver a lecture in Colorado Springs. He sent Paul a letter about his visit. Paul was thrilled to receive the letter and wrote back to Washington, who was staying at the Brown Palace Hotel, that he would be willing to greet him on his arrival in the city and, if a couple of hours were available, drive him to the house where he was staying and catch up there. The separation of time, space, and political opinion, not so much age, although Washington was a little over a decade and a half older than Paul, undermined too much the possibility that the men could grow close. Still, any communication from Washington continued to have a remarkable effect on Paul, who tended to drop whatever he was doing or planned to do to accommodate interaction or partnership with the Tuskegee leader. One major occasion marked Paul's reverence for Washington. In late September, after Washington had delivered a lecture solving the Negro problem at the Central Presbyterian Church, both men, along with Charles S. Thomas, governor of Colorado, were featured in a banquet later that evening at a cafe. For the occasion, Paul had written a speech in which he recounted his first impressions while visiting Tuskegee only 11 months earlier. At the speech's climax, he admitted that this experience had dispelled the skepticism he first held in assessing the worth of Mr. Washington's work. For a long time, we've heard of this man of Tuskegee, and for a long time, we've been told great things of the work he's done away down there in the black belt of the South, where our own people, our brothers and sisters and their children have so little opportunity for, develop, for development along the best lines. But here, what we may, from whatever source we may, we can know nothing of the great work that is being done there until we have been and seen for ourselves. Then our cry will be that of the Queen of Sheba in coming to the court of Solomon. The half has never been told. I can never forget my first visit to Tuskegee. I went there a skeptic. I came away a convert. I went there questioning. I came away wondering. Before me lay no longer theory but facts in the case. Facts and broad acres, wide fields, bricks and stone, and a thousand bright advancing young men and women who said, indeed, what that boy years ago had said in words. We are rising. In the years since Paul had published Our New Madness, castigating industrial learning for the Negro, he had over and again demonstrated in person to Washington that he had come around to appreciating this educational and economic philosophy of racial uplift, especially in light of the more extreme views of, of people out there. By the fall of 1900, Paul had to come to convey his support in print not only explicitly in content, but in poetic form as well. The word is writ that he who runs may read. What is the passing breath of earthly fame? But to snatch glory from the hands of blame, that is to be, to live, to strive indeed. A poor Virginia cabin gave the seed, and from its dark and lowly door there came a peer of princes in the world's acclaim. A master, of, a master spirit for the nation's need. Strong, silent, purposeful beyond his kind. The mark of rugged force on bro and lip. Straight on he goes, nor turns to look behind. Where, the hot, where hot the hounds come baying at his hip. With one idea foremost in his mind, like the keen prow of some unforging ship. In the October issue of the New England Magazine, a sonnet by Paul appeared with the unmistakable title Booker T. Washington, an explicit reference for this peer of princes, this master spirit renowned for his relentless, rugged force. Paul sent a copy to Booker T. Washington himself, who is nothing less than effusively grateful in response, perhaps his most effusive to date. I thank you very sincerely for sending me a copy of the New England Magazine and more heartily for the poem which you were kind enough to dedicate to me, he wrote. With a November reprint of the poem in the periodical Outlook, which Washington also noted with thanks, Paul's latest effort in verse was effectively eclipsing the essay that had initially polarized him from Washington in the public eye. As his thoughts evolved more and more from the original publication of Our New Madness, he had grown more sympathetic to the rationale behind promoting industrial education. 
Give the Negro, I should say, thorough industrial training, he told an interviewer. And if anything among them are able to get above this, let them do it. In spring 1901, Paul received two special pieces of mail. The first document appointed him to the rank of colonel for the inaugural parade of William McKinley, who had been elected to his second term as president with the familiar face of John Hay, who had ascended from US ambassador to the United Kingdom uh, to Secretary of State in 1898 within McKinley's cabinet, Paul continued to benefit from recognition at multiple levels of government. Scheduled for March 4th, the inauguration would represent his most public affirmation. The second document further distinguished Paul. It assigned him the role of the A to the third civic division. Upon reflection, the prospect of riding on a horse during the parade discouraged him. So self-conscious he was of appearing a novice, he, tempted to, he was tempted to decline the prestigious invitation. Only at Alice and Matilda's behest, his wife and his mother, did he change his mind and consent to go. This was not the first time Paul's clout in the halls of government referred to his literary stature. Ever aspiring to reinforce his own political work of network of influence, Paul not only commanded the ear of Washington, but had proactively sought out the explicit protection of Theodore Roosevelt when he was governor of New York. Since that time, Roosevelt had gone on in 1900 to finish his service as governor so that he could campaign on the Republican ticket as vice president while McKinley vied for the presidency. The McKinley-Roosevelt ticket won the 1900 election Within the span of one year, in September 1901, McKinley was assassinated and Roosevelt automatically became president, the youngest ever to hold this office. Now, the government who had once sought to assure Paul that he would be shielded from New York debt collectors was henceforth the most powerful man in the world. Paul had a direct line of communication to Roosevelt as indicated by the case of Dr. Austin Maurice Curtis in fall of 1901. Curtis belonged to a social circle that included Paul and extended from Chicago to Washington, D.C. Four years Paul Sr., Curtis was by the 1890s well distinguished. He had earned a baccalaureate degree from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and a medical doctorate from Northwestern University in Evanston. Afterward, he embarked on a career as a practicing surgeon in Chicago, where he was appointed in 1896 as the first African-American physician to work in the city's Cook County Hospital. Two years later, he became surgeon in chief of the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, DC. He would have a corresponding appointment as a faculty member in the Department of Surgery at Howard University. Paul's social circles possibly overlapped with those of Curtis. Paul likewise lived in Chicago in 1893 during the World's Columbian Exposition and in the, eight, uh, in the late 1890s in Washington, DC. In both cities, the poet and the physician belonged to the tightly knit exclusive circles of African American professionals and intellectuals. But the more direct link pointed to Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Right after medical school from 1891 to 1894, Curtis studied under Williams as a surgical intern at Chicago's Providence Hospital. Williams and Curtis were close. While Paul lived in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1894, he was close friends with Charles Mitchell, who was working in the office of the Freedom Manufacturing Company. In a letter to Paul, Mitchell remarked that he was looking forward to a potential opportunity with Williams. I'm expecting a position at the Freedmen's Hospital under Dr. Williams, and if I can get it, Dunbar, I want you to come in the fall and spend a month or more with me. Through this link, Paul came to know Williams and regard him as a physician and friend, sometimes depending on him for medicine to get through his recurring bouts of illness. So close did Paul grow to Williams that when he secretly married Alice Ruth Moore, his physician was the one of the few people he told. Paul and Alice thereby came to be good friends with Curtis and his wife. In the last couple of months of 1897, the Dunbars and the Curtises regularly spent time together in Washington, D.C. Hence, when Paul heard that Curtis had abruptly retired from the Freedmen's Hospital, he wanted to know why. An extension of the Freedmen's Bureau, the Freedmen's Hospital was established in 1862 in Washington, D.C., where it would have a long-standing connection with the medical faculty in the campus of Howard University, charted five years later. 
when the Bureau was dissolved in 1872, the hospital came under, under the administrative remit of the United States Department of the Interior. To obtain the answer he needed on Curtis's retirement, Paul decided that he would contact not, he would contact not Ethan Hitchcock, Secretary of the Interior, but rather Hitchcock's superior, the person he was familiar with, Theodore Roosevelt. With Paul's letter in hand, Roosevelt wrote to Hitchcock on October 1st, 1901. Paul Lawrence Dunbar is a man for whom I have high regard on account of his literary ability, he declared. Would you look into this case and report to me? Hitchcock investigated and relayed the outcome to George Cotillieu, secretary of the to the president, who went on to write a letter to Paul a week later. Referring to your recent letter in regard to the case of Dr. Curtis, I find upon inquiry that after a very careful investigation, the Secretary of the Interior concluded that the interest of the public service in connection with the administration of the affairs of the Freedmen's Hospital necessitated Dr. Curtis's retirement. And accordingly, Dr. William War Warfield has been appointed to succeed him. Warfield studied medicine at Howard University and starting in 1894, interned at the Freedmen's Hospital. Like Curtis, he trained under Williams to be a surgeon. Given the pedigree of his academic training, Warfield was a logical choice to succeed Curtis. During his appeal to Roosevelt, Paul swung by the White House and left behind one of his books as a token of appreciation. William Loeb Jr., Assistant Secretary to the President, transmitted Roosevelt's gratitude, but he also reaffirmed the poet's direct access to the President. I am directed by the President to thank you cordially for the book you left at the White House for him, Loeb wrote and to say that the next time you call, he desires you to be sure and see him. Word of President Roosevelt's open door policy was likely music to Paul's ears. Luckily for Paul, the support from Roosevelt came, he came to enjoy was hidden from the public. A few weeks after Roosevelt courteously launched an investigation into Curtis's retirement, the president would do something that roused the ire of many opponents and even supporters from around the country. Roosevelt dines a darkie, so ran one newspaper headline. Roosevelt proposes to coddle the sons of hand, so said another. To wit, on October 16, 1901, the President of the United States invited Paul's contemporary, Booker T. Washington, to dinner at the White House when he heard that the Tuskegee leader was in town. Washington accepted, and that evening he dined with Roosevelt and his wife, Edith. Roosevelt's worldview, both personal and shaped by his family, was that African Americans as a whole were inferior to whites in the short term, a consequence of the still rather brief period that they had been emancipated from slavery and enfranchised as a political class. Contrary to mainstream belief, he did envision in the long term their collective advancement, as part of American civilization. Until then, he admired and embraced only those very few African-American men he came into contact with and permitted into his inner circle. Roosevelt's invitation anointed Washington the first African-American ever to be a dinner guest at the White House. Two weeks prior to this controversial event, the record shows Paul likewise had a standing invitation to see the president. Considering the media firestorm that swirled after the fateful dinner with Washington, Roosevelt came to regret that his decision was politically negligent. In spite of that, he believed that, quote, action was absolutely proper and that the only wise and honorable and Christian thing to do is to treat each black man and each white man strictly on his merits as a man. Through this lens, Roosevelt came to appreciate Paul for the handful of years that they corresponded the president proved to be an unwavering guardian of what was in the poet's best interest. The record would show that over the course of their lives, Roosevelt, in his own words, eventually, quote, had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Dunbar once or twice and did so because he was a great admirer of his poetry and prose. Paul lay at death's door. Paul, poet Paul Dunbar dying, read one headline, of, local, of a local newspaper as early as fall of 1904. For five weeks, he had been confined to his bed the greater portion of the time at his home, one article stated in a Cleveland Plain dealer. Consumption is taking his life. It hypothesized ominously. 
It is probable that the voice of the singer Paul Lawrence Dunbar, whose writings in prose and poetry have given him a distinguished name as a poet laureate of the race, will be hushed by death before many days, close quote. Medical experts had urged him to find a better climate with clearer air and warmer weather. I have indeed been very ill and I'm glad to be here at home where good nursing and good air ought to do me good. Paul wrote an acquaintance in October of 18, 1904. But I fear that I am not going to be allowed a chance to stay as the doctors are crying California, California, even as before they cried Colorado. The following month, as Paul's health declined, his friends and acquaintances grew more despondent. They implored him to return to Colorado to convalesce, and he was taking their advice seriously. I was very glad to get a letter, to get your letter, or shall I call it note, and your plea, go back to Colorado. Strikes me very near the bullseye, he wrote a friend at the Denver Statesman. I am thinking of going back, but the transportation to California, it would not be by way of Denver. In the end, Paul would never go back to the West Coast. Over the next year, Paul confided his poor health to the most consequential person in the country, and in 1905, received a response. I am touched that you should write me from your sick bed, wrote Theodore Roosevelt, who was especially touched to receive a gift in Paul's letter, and had wished to exchange it in kind with his own. I appreciate the poem as a token of my regard. Will you accept the accompanying two volumes of my speeches? Paul did and shelved them in his office, which he called Loafing Holt. What compelled Roosevelt to give his books the first two volumes of presidential addresses and state pa papers of Theodore Roosevelt was a poem that Paul sent along as a sign of reassurance that at least this person, one who had enjoyed unwavering support ever since the president was governor of New York, was still rooting for him. There is a mighty sound a common from the east and there's a humming, and a bumming from the bosom of the west while the north has given tongue, and the south will be among those who holler that our Roosevelt is best. We have heard of him in battle and amid the roar and rattle when the foremen fled like cattle to their stalls. We have seen him staunch and grim when the only battle hymn was the shrieking of the Spanish Mauser balls. Product of a worthy sireling, fearless, honest, brave, and untiring, in the forefront of the firing, there he stands. And we're not afraid to show that we all revere him so to dissentience of our own and other lands. Now the fight is on in earnest, and we care not if the sternest of encounters try our valor or the quality of him, for there few who stoop to fear as the glorious day draws near, for you'll find him hell to handle when he gets in fight and trim. Roosevelt wrote his letter six days before the nation went to the polls to decide whether he should be reelected on the Republican platform as president of the United States or the De Democratic uh, Party's nominee, Alton Brooks Parker, a conservative judge, as he was called, would be elected. Perhaps more important, Roosevelt wrote it two days before he revealed to the world that he was in the fight of his political life. He had issued a thousand word press statement through the White House. Biographer Edmund Morris claimed that old time journalists had to look back to the 1880s for political utterance as packed with more force. He railed against Parker's accusations during his late October and early November speaking towards that George Cordillo had ascended the administration ranks from secretary to the president of, to the sec first secretary of commerce and labor in perfect proportion. Again, allegedly to Roosevelt's precise intent of dunning captains of industry to demand their financial support. Parker threatened to leak confidential information from the Bureau of Corporations with damning proof of his claims that in essence, the Republican National Committee colluded with Roosevelt to extort huge campaign donations from corporations. The White House press release with the claim that the statements made by Bista Parker are unqualifiedly and atrociously false sought to contain the October surprise, which was on the verge of devastating Roosevelt's reelection prospects. Behind the scenes, Paul reached out with a poem that encouraged the president amid the political controversy 
likely a jab at Parker and his ilk, Paul assured him that support existed across the country despite the opposition that we all revere him so to dissidents of our own and other land. This po politician was a fighter, and this poet was like, like, likewise willing to fight on his behalf. Roosevelt succeeded in his reelection bid. Saturday, March 4th, 1905 was the date set forth for thousands to converge on the Capitol and the surrounding 10 acres to witness him take his second oath of office. Through a couple of weeks remain, though a couple of weeks remain for him to attend the festivity, Paul anticipated visiting the Capitol and preparing for the arrival of visitors. A couple of girlfriends of mine from Dayton are coming to, on to Washington uh, to the inauguration, he wrote a friend, as he sought to find accommodations for them. For places to stay there were slim pickings, he knew. The best he could do was reach around for friends and acquaintances residing in the city he had once for several years called home. Inauguration day was cold. All attendees braced against the wind chill. Even for the president, a blustering wind tore at his hair and speech cards as he stepped forward to address the crowd, his silk uh, ribbon slapping the side of his face, even as he spoke for only a handful of minutes. Afterward, in the early afternoon, folks congregated toward the easternmost part of Pennsylvania Avenue. The parade was the most diverse ever. Fellow African-American Republicans milled among the Rough Riders and Harvard alumni, Native Americans and Grand Army veterans in a marvelous parade that lasted well over three hours. Presiding over all was Roosevelt, who reportedly stood alone in the constant wind, waving his tall hat, bowing, clapping, laughing. As a memento of this day, Paul kept a postcard of the inauguration published by Washington, D.C.'s P.J. Plant, captioned President Roosevelt taking the oath of office. The postcard featured a photograph of the exact moment Roosevelt was taking his second oath of office, his hand on the Bible as he was sworn in by Melville Fuller, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, with men in military regalia in the foreground and a full crowd standing shoulder to shoulder behind them a memorable day, both for Paul and for the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Jarrett. The floor is open for questions. Do we have a microphone? Christy has a microphone uh, that'll catch things for the video. Yes, down here, Dr. Neely. Uh, uh, Russ, wait for the uh, microphone, please. First of all, let me thank you uh, so much for your very uh, informative uh, talk. Uh, what I knew about Paul Dunbar was mainly of uh, what I knew about uh, the high school in Washington uh, named uh, after him, which uh, I've learned uh, from different sources, particularly Tom uh, Sowell. Uh, I wonder if you uh, could tell us something about Dunbar High School. I understand it was, uh, for many years, uh, uh, the, the most successful uh, high school in turning out uh, a black, uh, black elite. Uh, and it's, second, uh, it's not a question, but um, when I was growing up, Booker T. Washington's uh, Up From Slavery was a book that uh, people from all races and ethnicities would, would read and, and was found, uh, as, as I, I found it, very inspirational. Uh, it seems that uh, it's not read it anymore. I, I wonder if uh, there's any, any reason for that. I, I think uh, uh, people really miss out on, and particularly people who are concerned about uh, what you might call uh, self-improvement. It's very, very inspirational. I, I wonder if you could just uh, talk about uh, those two uh, comments. Great, wonderful. Thank you for your, for your uh, questions. First of all, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, after he died in 1906, there were many uh, high schools across the country that were named after him. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was a revered figure in the African American community across the country. And that high school uh, in particular was known especially for um, graduating many African American students uh, into the world. That's particularly the case because uh, in the Washington DC area there was a sizable African American community that uh, Dunbar himself um, uh, aspired to be a part of, but it's also true that there were many high schools across the country that, na that were named uh, after him, and it was a kind of a commemoration of Dunbar's legacy 
uh, his contributions to American life given his experience growing up in the Midwest. I will say regarding uh, Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, that's a legendary uh, work of autobiography. Uh, uh, way back when, well, not too far when I taught. <laughs> I'm a dean now, I have a day job, but I will get back into the classroom. I've taught uh, Up From Slavery in the genre of uh, 19th and early 20th century uh, African American autobiography. And Up From Slavery is a, an important title because you've probably heard in my talk I referred to racial uplift, or you remember the quotation from Dunbar himself saying, we are rising. There was this kind of doctrine of social uplift for African Americans, particularly in the decades after the end of slavery. There was a question about to what extent African Americans could achieve um, political franchise through voting, but also how well they could achieve um, uh, the educational tools that they need to persevere uh, in a modern America. Booker T. Washington published his uh, autobiography, Up From Slavery, that talked about his own personal life uh, in terms of the humble beginnings that he had uh, through Virginia and also eventually as he became a political leader. This book was especially important because Booker T. Washington at the turn of the 20th century was probably the most um, revered African-American political figure of his time, more so than uh, W.E.B. Du Bois who had uh, written uh, The Souls of Black Folk, which is a critique of the, ed the vocational ethos of education for African Americans. Just specifically, Booker T. Washington argued that the best way for African Americans to progress in society is to gain uh, education through the vocational arts, through manual work, as opposed to uh, the life of the mind, the kinds of things that we would associate with classical humanistic education. There's a famous line in um, Up From Slavery where Booker T. Washington laments the sight of an African American boy in the plantation fields reading a poem or reading uh, a, a classical text, the kinds of things that we would do in, naturally in a classroom at Princeton, he would say, what does it mean that you would have a, 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 an African-American boy who's reading that in the fields rather than doing the hard-worn work? And so on the other hand, you have a W.E.B. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk who's arguing for higher education, and they were essentially viewed uh, in kind of intellectual conflict. I'm inclined to say that as we are at the turn into the 21st century, W.E.B. Du Bois is more revered in, in terms of the historiography of African American intellectual life than Booker T. Washington, because Booker T. Washington himself was rather critical of political agitation and intellectual approaches to political um, activism. But I think if you look at the historical record, you find that Booker T. Washington himself was an influential figure. He contributed to the African American community. And Dunbar himself, as I tried to illustrate in the book, was in a way oscillating between these different poles mm -hmm. of, yes. of thought. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, to what extent do you advance the life of the mind, which he demonstrated as a poet. But on the other hand, he realized the pragmatic benefit of the vocational education that Booker T. Washington had promoted. And so I do touch on in this book this kind of uh, pendulum uh, that Dunbar uh, goes through. And, and I think Up From Slavery, to the extent that it's assigned, is, is an important book for people to read. Gene, as I was reading the biography, uh, I was My biography? Your, the, the, bi your biography you wrote. <laughs> We're waiting for yours, the biography of, uh, of Dean Jarrett. Uh, but I was struck at, at points that Dunbar seemed to be the kind of person who might today describe himself or be described as spiritual but not religious. That's right. And the black church was such and is such an important part of the American, African American experience that I was left wondering, well, what did the leadership of the church make of, of Dunbar? Uh, he, he has this sort of spiritual quality. He speaks in churches, as you mm -hmm. recount in the book. Uh, he's welcome, mm -hmm. of uh, but he's not of the, at least he comes across to me in the book, is, is not really of the fold. No, exactly. So how did they process that? What did they make of him? That's a, that's a great question, and I think there's a bigger 
uh, set of issues we can touch on in, in relation to your question. But uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the book that uh, his first recital was on Easter Sunday, and it was associated with uh, a Methodist African Methodist Episcopal Church that he was a part of in uh, in uh, in Dayton, Ohio. And so, in a way, he was part of a family that appreciated religion to the extent that you had many African American families coming out of slavery. They they leaned on religion in order to make sense of the world. But he was wrestling with his spirituality. In that first novel that I touched on uh, called The Uncalled, which launched me into Dunbar for for decades thereafter, uh, that's a story about a a young man who is trying to come to grips with his own spirituality, uh, coming from a family that uh, has a profound religiosity, but he himself uh, as he's growing into the life of the mind, is wrestling with his spiritual relationship with his family and with the church. The thing I'm inclined to say is that if you take the long view of African American literary history, there is a tension between the intellectual and the church. If you look at uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, even his, in his writings, and also you can put aside um, Linda Brent, but Frederick Douglass, he often when he faced such despair, he kind of questioned um, the ability of, of religion to redeem him in the face of slavery. Even if you go as late as uh, Richard Wright's uh, Black Boy, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's a, a work published uh, close to the mid-20th century. Again, it, there's a kind of a wrestling between an understanding of one's existence in the world through literature, through uh, the kinds of... Um, you know, literary genealogies that you can use to build out your understanding of how you relate to people in the world with uh, religion itself. And you find uh, actually moments when African-American intellectuals have been rather critical of, of religion. You, fa- you see a, a, a similar kind of wrestling in the life of James Baldwin. He's someone who uh, uh, comes from a religious uh, family, and he had been a part of the black church. But as you can see, as time goes on, and he is reflective on, on his um, sexuality and his spirituality, that he had tensions with the church. And so I, I bring all of that up, uh, Robbie, because I've, I've noticed that thinking about Dunbar's kind of spiritual conundrums or his spiritual reflections or self-reflections can be viewed in that wider lens of African-American meditations on religion and how uh, the intellectual life or, or certain literary valences can pull them to and again and away from. That's just fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Will. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very inspirational talk. What I find incredible is that this man uh, was born in the late uh, 19th century and somehow got a great love of learning. Are there lessons for us in universities today for how we can uh, use him as an example to promote uh, a love of uh, advanced education, not just in, say, uh, African uh, students, but uh, students from all walks of life that come from disadvantaged backgrounds? That's a, that's a fabulous question. How much time do we have for me to answer that question? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because uh, it's at the core of, of my being. You know, when you think about uh, Dunbar, um, he was born, as you said, in, in 1872, and by the time he hit his literary prime in the 1890s, it was only three um, uh, decades away from the end of slavery. If you put that in perspective, three decades ago is in 1990. You, many people here would say that the 1990s was not a long time ago. Right? <laughs> I, I still remember the Olympics and Carl Lewis running the 100-meter dash. I mean, it, those things are still vivid. And, and to think that at that time he was confronting what were likely preconceptions about what he could do or what he could be as a child of slaves. That's something that he had to reckon with. The thing that I take away from his life, and, and I will say that it, you know, I, I, I reveal the good and the bad regarding his life. I don't paper over anything, is how uh, the life of the mind, uh, literature is the portal to uh, freedom. And that has been the story of a people, let's say in the 19th century, African Americans who were dispossessed. It's already been shown that uh, if you were able to read and write, that was your access to opportunities if you were a slave. And it also nonetheless became the access to opportunity 
uh, after the end of slavery. For someone like uh, Dunbar, he was someone who he went to Central High School in Dayton, Ohio, and he wanted to study at Harvard. In fact, there were patrons, I, I talk about this in the book, who were willing to pay his way uh, through Harvard, and he never was able to get around to it. Why? Because he had to work. He couldn't afford it. He didn't have the generational wealth at his disposal. So what he did do nonetheless was um, he worked in an elevator, and he would read from the magazine and write poems while he was there, or he would deliver recitals uh, to, his, to the Midwest, or he constantly honed his craft uh, as a writer. And I think the resilience in uh, the life of the mind of advancing, of making your intellect more robust, improving as a writer, that's the story that we always should uh, 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 adhere to, even in this time. I'm inclined to say that you know, someone who went to Princeton, I, I remember when I wondered what I was going to do after writing this junior thesis, <laughs> right? You know, I, and, and, and I will say, I mean, I had Professor Toni Morrison as my professor who was a great inspiration to me, and she showed that you can earn a living if you work hard on your writing such that uh, you could have a, a story to tell. And I tried to think about, is there a story that I'm able to tell that could have an impact? on the world. I do so not through the literary arts, but I do so through literary criticism, and that comes through uh, educational perseverance. And so uh, regardless of whether you are uh, someone who, whose life is bereft of opportunities or if you have an abundance of opportunity, it's important to have that educational perseverance in the, in the face of circumstances. Yes, Dr. Brooks. <clears throat> Thanks for your talk. Um, I, I really was surprised, and, and I very much admire this capacity for this man to change his mind. He had this view of Washington, and I, I wasn't expecting this, and then in your lecture, you come around, and lo and behold, he changes his mind. And so I'm curious <clears throat> whether, given what you said <clears throat> a moment ago about um, Du Bois's criticisms of 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 Washington, and today that Du Bois is, you know, the louder voice among the two, mm -hmm. did uh, Dunbar face, any, uh, does his legacy face any backlash from his re-endorsement of Washington? So I, I guess I have two questions. At the time, okay, was, his, was he marginalized as a consequence of changing his mind by the black intelligentsia led by Du Bois? And then today, in the scholarship, the people look at him and say, oh, it was just because he had met a famous person and he was sort of overcome by Washington's fame that he changed his mind. Do they try to make this case? I'm just curious if, hmm. how this has affected him. I think that's a, that's a great question. You know, one of the things about writing a biography, let's say a comprehensive biography, is you have to tell all parts of the story, right? And so there's a way, perhaps up until my writing of this biography, that you can view these writers sort of in a kind of an intellectual vacuum, which is that he's grappling only in the world of ideas, right? And that, and I think ideas are very much in play. And so just uh, regarding the early part of your question, it's normal for a human being to vacillate a, among different viewpoints, right? And that's something that he, that he did. And I think there were a few things that, that came into play. First of all, um, I think Dunbar had a practical benefit in associating with Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington, in light of his network, was a remarkably influential figure. And Dunbar himself had quite a bit to gain in associating with him in terms of access to a variety of cultural uh, and, and political opportunities. And so, truth be told, uh, that is the kind of story that doesn't readily come out uh, in, the, um, in the scholarship, if you will. Uh, the thing I, I would say is, in, in retrospect, to what degree is Dunbar uh, perceived as being in one camp of the, or the other? It, it takes a bit of parsing through his primary works because he's known, especially today, as a poet. Most people, if you go into uh, Dayton, Ohio, you can go to a museum, let's say the Wright Brothers Museum, and have small children reciting his poem in order to get a badge uh, that they mm. can mm. sew onto their vest. Right? That is literally what, what occurs there. You'll also have people who were born and raised uh, memorizing Dunbar's poems and reciting them uh, in church. 
So he's known especially in that vein. What I've done in my biography is I've highlighted his contribution to black intellectual debates, which requires looking at his essays or you know, his, his long form prose pieces where you can get a deeper indication of where he stands um, intellectually. And then what you find therefore in that part, and I guess this is the scholarly intervention of my biography, is that he's someone who was especially critical of Booker T. Washington even before uh, the time that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was critical of him. W.E.B. Du Bois's critique of Booker T. Washington was especially around 1902, uh, 1903. Dunbar had reservations about it in the 1890s. And so from the matter, from the, from the standpoint of chronology, he was a, a precursor to W.E.B. Du Bois. And I guess what, what I would also say is that um, uh, that uh, Dunbar himself, nonetheless, as time went on, as you saw in that passage uh, that I revealed, he ended up having great appreciation for what was going on in Tuskegee. And so although in the world of ideas there were fundamental problems, when he went to uh, Tuskegee, Tuskegee, he was able to see the very practical benefits for African Americans there. And he came to understand that, you know, that the kind of intellectual life that he was leading did not necessarily apply to everyone. Thank you. I can't resist the temptation. I shouldn't help myself to another question, but um, this regard, the special respect that Theodore Roosevelt had for, yeah. for, for Dunbar, do you suppose that that in large part had to do with the fact that Roosevelt himself was a writer, and no slouch of a writer. Yes. He was a fine writer. Mm -hmm. He's not one of these politicians who gets a ghostwriter to write his book. Um, was it a writer's respect for a writer? Uh, that's a that's a, a, a great uh, question. You know, I, I think um, you know now that the biography is out and I'm relieved and I you know, have to after 14 years of working <laughs> on it, I, I suppose that you know when I when I reflect on it, there's and there's a passing line in my presentation about Dunbar's relationship with people in the halls of government, right? This kind of profound respect that um, political officials had for him. I think inside there, Robbie, I think there was a remarkable respect for uh, the intellectual mind. And I think colleagues or people like Theodore Roosevelt and, and other great writers uh, or, or politicians of that time uh, had great um, respect for writers and the extent to which they could be involved in mm. uh, civic society. There's a way that, if you take a, a close look at it, there is a is different from today, but at that time you had writers, even someone like William Howells, who uh, not only was a, uh, a um, cultural arbiter, but he was a novelist, this kind of blurring of lines between um, cultural and political criticism and literary art, mm -hmm. this kind of way in which you could have in a single person someone who has, is demonstrably wonderful in literary aesthetics, but also can make appeals to broader political arguments. I think there was this kind of um, fine line between the two, and Theodore Roosevelt himself was someone who was educated. He went to Harvard himself, and he was widely read, if you read the, 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 the multi-volume biography by Edmund Morris. He was someone who had great respect for the intellectual dimensions of, of American life. And I think uh, in that respect, there was always the instance that Dunbar would be legible to him. You know, despite all the other kinds of political and racial issues that, um, Booker T that um, Theodore Roosevelt was negotiating in terms of befriending Booker T. Washington, there was nonetheless a kind of um, important political impact in American uh, literary life. And so in that respect, I'm inclined to say, just to circle back to your point, that Dunbar was legible to Roosevelt insofar as uh, he was a poet who also had a political uh, discourse and was also someone who was um, especially uh, knowledgeable about uh, social life. And, and if that's true, that it's, it strikes me that that's an interesting respect in which the fact that Dunbar's black is less relevant. It's not irrelevant, but it's less relevant if what Roosevelt is seeing in him to admire is a fellow 
literary yes. uh, yeah. in a certain sense, a kind of an expert, yeah. a kind of yeah, I, think that's right. I, I, I think that's right. You know, there's a part of my um, biography where I talk about how Dunbar gets a job at the Library of Congress. And I include letters of correspondence between people in the halls of government, you know, the librarian of Congress, people who know Dunbar well, and the ways in which they're talking about Dunbar, you wouldn't even know that Dunbar was an mm -hmm. African American, because they had such a profound respect for him as a poet, yeah. and they had such attention to his literary promise, his future, that they wanted to uh, create an opportunity for him. Now, again, it wasn't lost on them that, again, He's black. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, only a few yeah. decades earlier, yeah. they're watching yeah. Carl Lewis at the Olympics. You know, you know my analogy. But yeah. uh, it's not a long time ago, and they saw that he descended from Kentucky slaves and that an opportunity should be made available to him because he has such promise. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Champy. Thank you so much for your talk. <clears throat> I have two questions, actually, and I'll ask, you know, um, the, the first, which is um, more general, picking up on your last comment, that uh, today Amer American politicians or politicians in general are less um, inclined on literary matters, and I think we can see that in all Western democracies that we, we can see the shift over the 20th century from politicians who have um, literary ambitions to politicians who come out of business schools. And then the, the question I would like to ask you is, should we go back to a more literary inspiration uh, for politics? Oh, wow. um, and uh, my second question is um, related to this debate um, between um, Booker T. Washington and Lawrence Dunbar on the model of development. Uh, that should be adopted for um, African Americans, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, since I can't help bring up the French Enlightenment for in all my questions, uh, this um, really um, reminds me of similar debates that happened between Rousseau and Voltaire, for instance, on which kind of activity should be favored. And I was wondering whether it would be relevant to see that as an opposition between a democratic model of development and an aristocratic model of development. So I'm wondering whether this divide between democ yeah, democracy and aristocracy applies in that context. Mm. That's a great, great question. Um, so the, your first question about literature and politicians, uh, well, um, Oh, that's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, first, I'm biased because I love literature, right? And so I think literature is good for everyone. Um, but I, I will say that, um, that uh, because of political interactions with different constituencies, if I may, I'm not a political scientist, so profoundly rhetorical uh, and, and involves such so many, uh, such a series of, rep of representations, symbolic representations, that I could imagine that um, literary expertise could provide some kind of dexterity in political discourse and exchange, right? And, and, I, and you find that you know, there, were, there are a number of writers in, a number of politicians in the 20th century who uh, nonetheless have published memoirs. In fact, you could argue that it, it, it's uh, customary for someone running to office to produce uh, a memoir, and that, the, and that genre of the memoir or the autobiography is a key genre of American literature in trying to um, uh, represent yourself to the broader public in strategic uh, rhetorical ways. And so th there's a way that you can, if, if you're willing to accept that the memoir or autobiography is symbolically thick and can represent that key genre of literature, then I think at minimum that is, that is possible and that could be a key context for thinking about um, the, how political figures kind of shape their own identities or their self-representations for consumption by the broader world, how that is mediated through the, the, the written word to the extent that that's, uh, that occurs. Um, I think regarding the, um, the second uh, question about aristocracy versus uh, democracy. I, I think it is true uh, to what extent um, is Booker T. Washington's approach to African-American well-being and uplift 
is, is more accessible publicly, right? To what extent is it a paradigm that is available to a variety of people, regardless of educational background? I think that's a, that's a beneficial point. If you look at someone like um, W.E.B. Du Bois and other black intellectuals at his time period, it's a very small group. They tended to be in the Northeast of the United States. They tended to you know, hail from uh, f formal institutions or even Ivy League institutions. But through the prism of American historiography, I'm inclined to say that they have a, a kind of um, a, an outsized impact on how we interpret African American life uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Not to say that it's wrong, it's just something that has occurred nonetheless. And so more people will teach and understand W.E.B. Du Bois than they would understand Booker T. Washington, even though, ironically, at that time, it was the opinion, not only of those in um, the broader American community, but also within the African American community, that the, the paradigms of Booker T. Washington was a more accessible and practical way of advancing African Americans through uh, 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 American life and economic and, and um, political and, and, and social, social ways. And so I, I do think it's fair to say that you know, if we uh, look at the Du Bois and Washington debate, that is very much a, a kind of a, a tension between two different approaches two different approaches at that time, but, but I will say that, um, that from the standpoint of the academic analysis of African American life at the turn of the 20th century, we privilege Du Bois exceedingly. And I even think it's regional. I remember I, my first job was at the University of Maryland College Park, and Du Bois did not have as much, uh, I, I'm looking at Francis Lee, yes, Francis and I, you know, that's where we were. You know, Du Bois did not have as much currency there as it did when I was at Boston University, right? Uh, you, know, it, you know, in terms of the linchpin of understanding, you know, it, it was Booker T. Washington was more, was, if I may, is it, if there's anyone from Maryland, I hope I'm not saying anything that's offensive, <laughs> but, um, but it, there was a way in which some of the, the values of up from slavery was, was more legible when I was teaching it at the University of Maryland as opposed to when I taught it uh, at Boston University where um, W.E.B. Du Bois really was seen as someone that we should privilege. Good. Uh, last question, right here. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, glad to have it. Um, my question is, because he was such an intellectual and coming at that point where there was so much fun, I guess is the, probably the wrong word to use, made about African-American culture the way whites would it, wear blackface and interpret it, what prompted him, other than I can understand for some money, to write something like Clarindy? Yeah, that's right. And I didn't show uh, Clarindy, but you know, he, you know, at that time uh, in the late 19th century, the, the, you know, there was a, a vogue for dialect uh, literature and performance, also for minstrelsy and, and vaudeville, those uh, kinds of cultural realms where there were racial stereotypes. And so uh, part of your, your comment uh, about the fact that he did it for money, uh, that's for sure he did that. That was a way in which he could earn a living. But I, but I will say that, um, and this probably pr requires a, a nuanced view of it, uh, even though he uh, leveraged some of these racial stereotypes in order to grab the attention in the commercial world, he still imbued these figures in his poems or in these shows with a certain degree of human agency that they otherwise were not granted in other aspects of, of American uh, literary culture. And so if you look at his depictions of African Americans or Charles Chestnut's depictions of African Americans versus what you would see by Joel Chandler Harris or George Washington Cable or even Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn uh, where you see Jim is by by turns human and also two-dimensional, you find that he nonetheless is imbuing African-American voices with a key degree of complexity and agency that requires close reading that we could do uh, today. So I still think that he found uh, 
the, the literary genre of racial stereotype or dialect as valuable insofar as he was able to experiment nonetheless with representations of African Americans. But uh, it's possible, it was, certainly was the case that when it was read at that time, it was viewed as just succumbing to stereotypes that people were familiar with. As time has gone on, particularly once you get to the 1960s and 1970s, when there's a resuscitation of interest in Dunbar's work, they were doing close readings of his writings and they found that he was investing a certain degree of complexity and agency. For example, they would see that these slaves would be, even though they're talking in dialect, rather critical of their enslavement, right, in ways that were not maybe picked up in their contemporary times, according to reviews. That close reading that you do over time is what reveals the, the nuances of the work, and that's why, as a literary artist, uh, he was in some ways ahead of his time. Well, before I invite you to join me in thanking Dean Jarrett for this wonderful opportunity to learn from him and his work, let me just hit a few highlights coming up uh, in the Madison program. Uh, on February 16th, we'll have Ian Rowe here to be in conversation with our own Anna Samuel uh, on the reform of K-12 education, especially in ways uh, to help uh, low-income families uh, better educate their children. Then March 20th, 21st, and 22nd, we'll be welcoming Professor Teresa Bedgen of Oxford University, the political theorist, who will be giving our 2023 Charles E. Test lectures. Those will be three cons consecutive evenings. March 20th, 21st, and 22nd. On March 28th, we'll be welcoming the constitutional scholar Michael Paulson, who will be giving our 2023 Walter F. Murphy Lecture on American Constitutionalism. Uh, April 12th, very special uh, event, very interesting one uh, that I hope you will attend. Joseph Horowitz, uh, John McWhorter, and Sidney Outlaw will be presenting Dvorak's uh, Prophecies, uh, which will be both a, a discussion and a concert. Then April 19th, Professor Stephen Sachs of Harvard Law School will be giving our 2023 Herbert W. Vaughan Lecture on America's Founding. And then finally, May 1st, Professor John uh, Tassiolos of the uh, Philosophy Department at the University of Oxford will be giving our 2023 Harold T. Shapiro Lecture on Ethics, Science, and Technology. Uh, Professor Tessiolos uh, is an expert and runs probably the world's most important center for the philosophical uh, investigation of artificial intelligence, which is something that we in the academic world have suddenly uh, become keenly aware of the need uh, to understand because of recent developments. So I'm sure you will want to join us for Professor Tessiolos' uh, lecture. And with that, please do join me in thanking Dean Jean Jerry. Thank you, Jean.